Okay. <laughs> got it. All right. So uh, this is well, this is third and, and last uh, talk in this series. And I well, I'd like to. I've said this before, I think, but I'm very happy to be here in Warsaw. So thanks for bringing me here. And but I'm going to do something because uh, Harry Tolunchik just accepted. <laughs> my invitation to see the, the talk, so I'll change the order in which I was going to say things, okay? So, oops. The chairman is late, so. So I'm going to, to give the second, what, what was meant to be the second part of the, 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 the talk, but it's sort of an independent talk anyway. So so I'll, I'll speak about going uh, on to, to 3D, okay? All right, so so here's what's going to happen. Uh, uh, so it turns out that there's a, a well something that we could call a sort of a method for going from uh, Markov endomorphisms, so to uh, diffeomorphisms. But in order to do that, you go, well, right? So to go from an endomorphism to a diffeomorphism, uh, you pay the price of adding one dimension. Right? So and this is related to taking the inverse limit, for example, which but, but when you take the inverse limit, you add infinitely many dimensions. I'm only going to add one dimension here. Obviously, that there have to be conditions on the story so that we do this. But in any case, I'll, 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 I want to discuss this, that uh, uh, it turns out to be sort of a method. You can just, just do this in many different uh, uh, circumstances, uh, instances, uh, and well, and, and one of the conditions is that the endomorphism I de I'm dealing with uh, has pieces that map over other, other pieces. Okay? So that's what being Markov means, and, we, and this will generalize, you know, several things that we have discussed here. Uh, for for example, how you get to a pseudo noise of home homeomorphism from an invariant train track, or how you get uh, from from the Blicken attractor, or from the, the, the you know the the, the 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 branched one manifold to the Blicken attractor, and how do you get anyway? So there are other instances in which this this, this occurs, and and the one what we want to do in this case is go one dimension higher and apply this to maps of the branched covers of the sphere of the two sphere. <laughs> which have some sort of Markov property that you can divide the sphere into pieces that map over other pieces. And from this setup, we want to go one dimension higher, two or three manifold. Okay? And <clears throat> this will come at a price, and the price is that this, this three manifold was not going to be exactly three manifold, it will have a singular point, one singularity, given the... But in the presence of uh, 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 symmetry by involution, this, we can actually, by taking the quotient by an evolution, if this symmetry is present, you actually go down to the three sphere. So that's, uh, and then, like I said, this is related to the inverse limit after all, uh, by a semi conjugacy You can take a quotient from the inverse limit to these, you know, one dimension higher space, uh, and then the semi conjugacy is very mild typically. I mean, there, there may be one point where, where infinitely many points map to it, but aside from that, you know, most fibers of this, this, this quotient are, have two points. All right, so let me get uh, to, to, right, so let me. Yeah, so, uh, yes? The, 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 the shared screen is probably at least on my computer. I don't know whether it's a problem. Can you maybe share it? Once again. So what do I do here? Stop here. And okay, now, um, oops, more um, share screen. So I want to share this screen. Yeah, correct. Yeah. Okay. Oh, but I do have to do control L again. I see. I have control L. Hmm. Control L doesn't work anymore. 
So control Q well I do was, was that right? No. Okay. Uh -huh. All right. So so here's the setup. Uh, you, you have so and, and for for this discussion today, I'll, I'll use only finitely many intervals or only fi finitely many polygons in the plane. Uh, these finitely many intervals will turn out to be one interval. They finite will be one. Uh, uh, finitely many polygons, maybe there'll, there'll be two or something like that. Uh, but in any case, so finitely many intervals, and then the polygons are usually going to be rectangles, so this is the simplest possible situation. And these intervals, or the, these polygons, or rectangles, are subdivided into finitely many sub-intervals or sub-rectangles, sub okay? And, and, and then there will be also homeomorphisms from each one of the sub-pieces, the Rij, over some other piece. Some, some homeomorphisms that map uh, pieces of each of one of the rectangles over homeomorphically onto uh, another piece, a, a bigger piece, a piece of the, the, the you know, the like first and, and you know, the zeroth and first level or something. So the smaller pieces map over the zero level pieces. And then there may be some added structure, like uh, the, these maps would be linear or that they be holomorphic or whatever. Uh, okay, so here are examples, and there'll be four running examples for the talk. Uh, so here is, is an example where two intervals or, or one interval subdivided into two, or we're right, in this case here, there's only one interval subdivided into two halves, and the two halves map completely over the entire interval and in an orientation preserving and orientation reversing way. And this is the same good old temp map, okay? And here's a, another example. You have, again, only one piece subdivided into two pieces, but then the map is different, okay? So the map, uh, the, the left half, say, maps uh, here, orientation preserving, and the right half also maps orientation reversing, okay? So there's, you know, there's the breakpoint there. Okay, no problem. And then, and then there, okay, this is, I, I don't want to get into train tracks, but this applies to, you know, the discussion can be upgraded or, or elaborated in, in, in other circumstances. But here, here's the two-dimensional uh, uh, setup. We again have uh, uh, one uh, square, only one square, divided into four subsquares. This should have subdivisions here, but in any case, uh, right. Anyway, so it's one subsquare subdivided into four subsquares. And then the map is like this. Uh, we, we multiply the sides by two, okay, we expand this thing by a factor of two, and then you map each expanded piece over the original square in a certain way. And there are two ways in which I want to do this. The first one is as if I had, a, I actually had a, a prop last time around. You take a square, you expand it by two, and then you fold it and fold it. And that's the first example. Okay, and the second way I want to do it, I expand it by four, cut it, and then restack. Okay, that's the second. And and this restacking, of course, I can restack it like this, or I can restack it, bending it. But let's just let's just rearrange, restack by translations without quotations. Okay, uh, so those are the two. So okay, so these are the four running examples. Okay, the the the, the tent map. This well, this is x goes to 2x mod 1, if you will. And then there are these two uh, very simple uh, examples of, of, of taking a square, dilating it, and, re and stacking it over itself. All right, so these are the, 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 the four running examples. Tent map, x goes to 2x, z goes to 2z folded, and z goes to 2z mod z2. All right, so so then the first thing I, I you know I gave these things names and 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 these examples they're they're called covering Markov schemes. Oh, I, you know, just a fancy name for for something that I just explained is the, the, this this thing that you you take pieces you, you which map over other pieces and and obviously uh, just just like happened in the, these examples, uh, you know the original rectangles uh, get covered many times, okay? So it's, these are endomorphisms. All right, but then we want to, uh, to 
to fix uh, uh, possible discontinuities. Okay? So when you have a piece that gets torn in half to map to two different pieces, for example, or several different pieces, you want to glue the pieces that they, they map over, okay, to fix the discontinuity. And if you do this, you know, if you add you know, some reasonable conditions, you end up, when you, when you do this gluing, right, you, you, every time one, you have to tear a piece apart to glue, to map over two different pieces, you just glue these pieces so as not to have uh, 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 discontinuities discontinuities anymore. And then, you know, the result of this gluing uh, is a branched one or two manifold. Okay. So we um, under reason. So let's, so the, the first two examples were continuous, right? So uh, this example and this example are continuous, so there's nothing to do there, but the other two are not continuous, right? I mean, you have this break here, but then what you do is you take your original space and you glue this point to this point to make this a continuous map. And then you get you know, the usual circle with the doubling map on the circle now. And over here, when you do the gluing, just the, the way I, I said it, uh, for, for the second you know, cut and restack, what you get uh, of identifications on the boundary of the original square is the usual thing about the torus. You glue this side to this side and this side to this side with these orientations. So the, the glued up, uh, branch surface turns out to be an actual surface, and it turns out to be the torus and not, say, the, if you had flipped one of these things, you might get a, a, a Mobius band or so, something like that. And, but in any case, uh, so that's uh, the, the idea. And, okay, so then we want to change these guys, which are endomorphisms, into uh, homeomorphisms, and the price we're going to pay is that we have to add a dimension to that. So how are we going to do this? Uh, we're going to thicken every one of the original pieces, and maybe better than to to, to read these things here, which I, I don't even know if I can do. Although, right. So so you take each one of the rect the original rectangles or original intervals, and you thicken it to a rectangle or to a slab, to a prism in dimension three, to a cube. Okay. And you think of those things, and then the 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 original uh, uh, homeomorphism that covered now will map into. But let me explain it, it, it with examples it's easier than to be trying to. So here's the is the first example, the tent map. Okay. So I'm going to take each one of these well pieces, or maybe even the whole interval, and I'm going to thicken it to a square. Okay. And then uh, there were two pieces here, one, one which went orientation preserving and one reversing. And then I take these, the, well, the square divided in half, just like I divided the, the interval here in half. And now I squeeze vertically, stretch horizontally, and place it here exactly in the same fashion as there. Right? This is what I did in a previous lecture for the tight horseshoe. In the, the second example, example 1.2, I do the same thing, but instead of so right, so here I took the square here, squeezed, stretched, and bent. To, so this, the yellow point goes to the yellow point, and the red point there turns upside down and comes to here. Right? So in the in the in you know the the circle x goes to two x on the circle map. Uh, so this is different. You stack uh, the both pieces going in the same direction. So this point goes to this point. It's fixed. And the red point also goes to the red point because you, you stretch and stack like that. Okay? So there are two different ways of, 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 well, of, of, of doing what I said. But again, we want to fix this continuity, just like we fix, we fix them to produce a, 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 branch man, a branch one or two manifold in the, uh, the covering, you know, the endomorphism situation. Now we want to fix it in this, which is sort of one-to-one -one situation, but we want it to be continuous. Uh, so here are the, 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 the two examples. So we squeeze, cut, and then, you know, turn, put the one down here and the one upside down. So that's example 1.1. And this other one here, just slide them, you know, the left to the top and the bottom to the, but by translation. Okay, and here are examples two, one, and two, two. You well, so that's the, the folding and the stacking, but now you thicken the square to a, a big slab, and then you squeeze the big slab 
by a factor of four, multiply the base by a factor of two in both directions, and then cut those things and restack them, or either by folding, like here, I'll show a different picture. So this one, one, two, three, four, the folded pattern here is repeated here, and I'll show you another picture for this in a second, and the restack picture is over here, one, two, three, four, whereas this is one, two upside down, three and four upside down. Okay, but on any, uh, so here's another picture. Why can't this thing disappear? Oops. Well, anyway, well, not so bad. So example 2.1, again, the folded example is you take the, the slab, the cube, you squeeze it by a factor of four, expand the base by factor two in each direction, that, you know, is, or, well, is air well, volume preserving. And then what do you do with these four guys is that you fold Right, so I think the, the way this picture is, you fold like that, and then you fold like that. Okay. So I have, yeah. All right, so, right. So, but when, when we fold like this, right, we're ripping it uh, in the middle there. And when we fold it like that, we're ripping it in the other middle going like that. And well, we have to fix that. And to fix that, we have to do identifications. So here, oops, oh dear. Oh yeah, yeah. Oh well, here are the identifications which I should have shown in a slide before. But here is so th these are the identifications on the uh, I don't know the right side. These are the, the oops. These are the identifications on the back. But I really should have had this here, but. Anyway, but so these are the original. So that's the first iteration of the map. But then you have to keep doing it because you know you have to fix all the infinitely many rips that there would be. So you have to take images of these guys and they they map to the other two uh, sides of. So, so these are the four sides of the the vertical sides of this cube here, kind of opened up. So you have these two guys, and then th their images map to here and there, and then the image of these map to here and there, and then you get some sort of a canter set's worth of, of foldings in half and half and half and have some complicated pattern, which is perfectly describable here and here, but I don't want to get into the details, but you get the infinitely many folds, which get thinner and thinner in these pieces, this piece, that piece, and that piece. Okay. All right, so, but, but let me let me explain this uh, in one dimension lower again, <clears throat> not, so right, so to fix these tears, you have to, well, and then, right, so we have to fix the tears, and then you have to fix the non-injectivity, because the top, you know, every time you stack, you, you make the top, and you know, top of one of these blocks and then the bottom of the other to touch, and then you have to fix those non-injectivity uh, points as well, okay? So that will lead to, uh, to other identifications on the, on the horizontal faces. And, and obviously this has to be done dynamically, so you have to do infinitely many identifications. Okay? So here is the example uh, uh, of the doubling map on the circle. Okay? So you take, again, you take the interval, you thicken it to a square, right? and then the square maps by squeezing vertically, uh, stretching horizontally. And I just noticed that I did it uh, here in the different way, right? I, from what I had in the previous picture, I'm putting the left, uh, half at the bottom and the right and the right half at the top. Okay. Well, but as I tear here, it, well, from the left part, I get to the bottom there. And from the right, I get to the up to the top here. So I have to glue this part to that part. Okay, the bottom of the, <clears throat> the bottom half of the right side to the top half of the left uh, edge of the square. Okay. Well, but then these guys are mapped to a, a piece here, and this one is mapped to a piece there. So I have to glue those, and that, here's the picture. So I have to glue purple to purple, which is this original uh, gluing here, but then I have to glue the image of purple to the image of purple, and the image of this purple here is the green here, and the image of this purple is the green here, so I have to glue those one to the other, and then I have to glue the image of the image 
which is yellow or ochre to ochre and so on and so forth. So I get infinitely many gluons getting smaller and smaller, accumulating at this point and, and, and accumulating at this point. Mm -hmm. So that's, that fixes the non, uh, the non, the discontinuities, right. But then there's also the problem that the top of, of, of the left half and the bottom of the right half map to the same line, which I separated here for, you know, for illustration purposes, but they should really be the same line. So I have to glue those together. And that's the dark blue here. Uh, gluing to the dark blue there, and then the pre-image is this lighter blue here, gluing to this lighter blue there, and then so on and so forth. There are infinitely many more blues. <laughs> and then after you glue all these together in, you glue also the, the, that corner to this, the, the top left, top right corner to the bottom left corner, you get some surface. Okay? Well, not quite. Because each one of these uh, gluings produces genus. And the quotient of this thing here is a surface of infinite genus, and the genus is accumulating at that point there. So this is only a surface. Of the, the, so that there has a single point, which is a non-surface point, which is that point over there. If you remove it, then you have an open surface mm -hmm. of infinite genus. And then you have a map here, which, which again is one of these linear maps. It squeezes vertically, it stretches horizontally, and has the matrix is linear, you know, and this. And these Euclidean coordinates there, these Cartesian coordinates actually with horizontal and vertical axis, and it squeezes vertically by two, stretches horizontally by two. Mm -hmm. so that's, and that's not even a pseudo nosov map. It's an anosov map. There are no singular ball, except for the singular point. If you remove the singular point, it's completely anosov. There are no singular points, no singularities of the foliations anymore. Okay, the, the singular, the, 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 the foliation is completely uh, regular at all points, well, except obviously. At that point, which is not a surface point, this the surface has a name. It's called the Chamanara surface. Okay. All right. So let's go one step, one dimension up, and go back to this to the folding uh, 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 stack. You know, the folding thing of the the square. Uh, so right. So these are the identifications that you have to do to make this map continuous. Okay. So that. Sorry. Let me. Sorry. So the map that folds on this side and folds on the back. So the back side is folded sort of only once, where the and then there are two folds on the on the side which appear here. So those are the the, the picture I have in the middle there. And the back is the one that has only one fold. And then this side and the front are the ones which get infinitely many folds. So this is the side, the back, and, and these guys, these two guys get infinitely many uh, patterns, a pattern with infinitely many identifications. Um, right. All right. But, and, and that fixes the continuity. So, so that turns, so in this portion to space, the map is continuous, but it continues to, it, it is continuous, but it continues to be non-injective. Okay. And then, uh, we have to fix the injectivity and the injectivity you again have to do, uh, really should, does anybody have a piece of paper, paper to Thank you. So uh, I could uh, I could show off here and show, tell you how how expert I am at, at turning this A4 piece of paper into a square, but I'm not going to do that. But the map is is you fold like that in half, and then you fold like this a second time, and this should be a square again. It isn't that because all right. But but then to fix non-injectivity, you see, I have to glue the top to the top, which is what here. Okay. okay. But once I do that, well, okay. But then there's the second fold, which forces me, you see. So once I folded it once like this, th this is the bottom now, it came from the bottom, and I'm folding it in half. So, but, but, but that's only half of the bottom. So there's a half of the bottom here that has to be folded in half. Okay. So that's that. Well, but then you have to do it again. And, and then what appears at the top here now is the bottom. It used to be the bottom, so you have to do it again and again. And that forces you to fold the, you know, to divide this thing in half and fold half uh, in, in half. And well, you have to keep track of what you're doing, but then you have to do infinitely many folds. 
And they are organized like that. You divide in half and fold in half in the other direction, you divide in half, fold in half, and so on. And you get infinitely many <clears throat> identifications like that. Okay, and once you have done this, why then, you know, this point here have, has to get identified as many other points. But in any case, uh, <clears throat> uh, now you get a, a, a space uh, which is uh, where you get a homeomorphism, which is, um, well, you get a homeomorphism, right? it's continuous and injective and surjective. So it's a homeomorphism of the quotient space. Now, the question is, what is the, the quotient space? And again, every time I ask this question, it, it's answered on the slide. So this space uh, is the, the three sphere, right? Uh, but why is it the three sphere? How do you prove it? Well, you have to do some work. And, 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 and one, one thing you can try to do, which is why I was talking to Harry earlier, that you could try to embed this identification space that is the cube with all these side identifications, this top and bottom identifications in the three sphere and realize these identifications by a, a cellular upper semi-continuous decomposition on the three sphere. Okay? But then there is a problem or something that you have to verify that this uh, semi upper, monotone upper semi-continuous decomposition of the three sphere is shrinkable. Doing this one dimension lower is easier because you don't have to verify. Shrinkability is immediate in, in two dimensions. And in three dimensions, it's not. Right? So there's a technical issue here that, anyway, so. All right, so let me uh, explain also what you have to do in the other example, in example 2.2, that you uh, you expand, you con contract vertically, expand uh, horizontally in both directions, and then cut and restack. Okay? So they will just say it kind of briefly because I don't want to be trying to chase these identifications. But what happens is again the the the, the you know the, the the vertical sides kind of opened up, and if you, if you chase around what we did in that cutting and restacking, uh, you have to do these identifications here. This green has to be identified as green, blue with blue, purple with purple, and and, and ochre with yellow with yellow. And again, these are the first identification you have to do, and then you have to dynamically push these forward. And once you do it infinitely many times, they fill up the, the other, the white, the, the white rectangles with identifications that get more and more complicated. But anyway, this fills up. And then also the top and the bottom have to be fixed. And this, the fixing is, so you, you identify pieces of top with, so this is written, you are sharing screen, right? Bottom there. So you, 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 you glue this purple to purple, blue to blue, green to green, and, and there's some infinite pattern that, that moves towards this, this, this corner there. All right, and then, okay, so, uh, so there is a, a, a major difference between these two cases, and the major difference here is that this construction can be realized, can be sort of, it can happen, you can realize it by a, a sort of a pseudo isotope in R3. Okay? Whereas, which, which is why, sort of that, that's the, the reason behind the fact that I'm saying that this quotient is a three sphere. Right? So this, these identifications here cannot be done, all of them together within three dimensional R3, but still you can show that locally uh, these, this, the, the resulting space is a three manifold with one exception. There's one exceptional point, which is this point at the corner here, which is identified with the point at the corner here. And it turns out it's going to be identified with many more points around somewhere. But it's very much like, like this, the situation here that you identify this to that, that to that, that to that. And then there's one bad point, which is this corner here, which is also this corner here, but it's also all the points with these tick marks. So all of these points with tick marks get there are infinitely many points identified to the corners. So and, and likewise in this situation here, there are, in, there are entire you know segments which get collapsed to a single point. Okay, so uh, the quotient is this, this singular three manifold. Okay, so there, there's this theorem here that says that you know uh, if you well I didn't say what an experimental map is. 
But there are such things called expanding thrift map. They're self maps of the sphere, uh, which are uh, branched covers of the sphere, such that the branch points have finite orbits. And if you add to both, so this is called the Thurston map. So if there's in the presence of some sort of uh, expansion, and this ex expansion is, can be described in many ways, but, but there are some combinatorial ways. If you if you take back pieces, if you divide your sphere into you know finitely many pieces and you start pulling them back under the inverse, you know these pieces may, may be getting smaller and smaller. And when they do, and there's some te technical condition, when they do get smaller and smaller, and they, the pieces all converge to points, you call this an expanding thirst amount. But there's some technical condition that that allows you to look. Well, there's a, some technical condition that a, a, a branched ramified cover of the sphere with finite critical orbit uh, can have. Okay? So if it does have that uh, uh, expansion property, then you can do this construction. This is based on, on this, this theory developed by Mario Bonk and, and Daniel Meyer. And then there's also, I think, in, in Pilgrim and, and Hysinski. Uh, and anyway, so and if you do that, then you finally, after a lot of work in a 600 page book, you get to prove that you can uh, divide your sphere into two pieces, actually. And these two pieces have exactly this property that I said, that these two pieces can be divided into 264 sub pieces each, each of which maps completely over the, the zero, zero level piece. And then you can, you, can, you can start this construction and therefore you can elevate each one of these branch covers of this, you know, Thurston branch cover of the, of the sphere to, to a three-dimensional uh, uh, space with a map, actually. I didn't talk much about the map, but still. And, okay, so that's the, 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 the theorem. And, and moreover, uh, this, the, there is a semi-conjugacy that actually sort of puts the inverse limit of the original Thurston map in there. And the semi conjugacy is fairly mild, with exception of the singularity, the singular point that has many points in the in, in the pre-image. Uh, uh, the, the the all other fibers have two points on it or three, finitely many anyway. Okay, so there's a semi conjugacy from the inverse limit to this branch uh, uh, to, to the singular three manifold with this map. And right, and then like I said, if there is an evolution, you can actually take a quotient. If there is an evolution, for example, if you start with a rational map which is real, right? So if, if you start with a real rational map with uh, with both critically finite real rational map, then there is the evolution of z goes to z bar, and that kind of evolution uh, produces a map like these folding maps that you fold within R three, and these folding maps the in in this construction they yield the three sphere. So that's, uh... all right. So th there are, you know, there are many questions that one could ask. I mean, what are these three manifolds? How much, they have infinitely generated fundamental group, but still, I mean, can we talk about these three manifolds? What are they? Do they have uh, interesting further structure, right? And how much information can you re recover, if, if any, from the original expanding Thurston map or, uh, uh, how, how is the, the dynamics of the expanding circle map related to the, the, this, this three-dimensional space? And uh, right, and this is a question here that, you know, these are like generalized pseudonosos, uh, but I sort of wonder if, if generalized pseudonosos always have infinitely many singularities, which is something that more or less came up here, but I wonder if there are, there are so the, the, the singularity uh, uh, is very complicated. And I wonder if there, there's a more exact analog of pseudo nozzles in which the, 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 the singularity set, for example, is just a knot or a braid in the, or a link in the, in the three nozzles. Okay, so this is the end of the first half. <laughs> but I'm already thanking you for, but well, this is the end of the second half, but uh, there, there's still the first half to go. And, and since I'm told to take a break, well, so I'm taking a break. Did I take a break too fast? Okay, but anyway, uh, yeah, I think I'm gonna take a break yes. <laughs> Okay, so okay, so break now. Yeah. Break yeah. yes. Okay, so uh, so welcome back to the first part of this talk, which comes after the second. 
So, right. So, uh, and the first time, so, right. So, just to recap, uh, the first talk I, I talked about this topological theory for two dimensional families, theory to describe the topological dynamics in families. Then, then we're trying to emulate the one dimensional uh, discussion, the one dimensional Milner Thurston theory, if you will. So that was the analogous of, of needing theory, at least the topological part of needing theory, topological combinatorial part of needing theory. But then needing theory had the second part, which is this conjugacy, semi conjugacy to a geometric model. The geometric model is you ge geometrize the interval, but you know the, the only ge possible geometry of the interval, I suppose, is putting a length on it, you, which you do carefully, and then the map becomes piecewise linear with constant slope. And then in the second part. Uh, the second talk I talked uh, about what I proposed as this class of maps which generalize what piecewise linear constant slope endomorphisms of the interval are. So, which are these maps called? Uh, okay, so here, here's the recall. <laughs> uh, so, in the, in the in the second lecture, we, we introduced this class of measurable pseudonauts of homeomorphisms, which are the 2D, well, expect them to be the correct 2D analog of piecewise linear constant slope models of endomorphism of the interval. Okay. And then today, uh, I, so there was this part here which I, I, I advanced, uh, second half, which had to do with, with upgrading this two dimensional or uh, uh, endomorphism of, of, of C to, to homeomorphism of, of three dimensional spaces. But then we're going to go back to this first half of the, the, what the lecture of have been uh, to how to set it right. So, how do we do the semi conjugacy from a two dimensional map to the model, okay, to the measurable pseudonauts of uh, model? Okay. All right. So, uh, and for that, we need to, to introduce an equivalence relation, uh, which uh, called the, the zero entropy equivalence relation. But, but the, the idea is this, we're going to, so just like in the, so in the one dimensional story, what happens is the following. Uh, we define the lap number, right? Which is the number of, of ups and downs of the iterates. And then we you know, take the limit, the square root, the nth root and the limit, and that's the growth number. And then we somehow uh, normalize by the growth number. We take a piece, see how many laps are there, divide by the total number past the limit. And that is the structure on the interval, which makes the map piecewise linear. Okay? But, but so that, that was how you know, I more or less described it here, but there's another, so this lap number is essentially the entropy or the, the log of the entropy. Or the log of any somewhere the exponential density. And, uh, and, and, and another way of describing that semi conjugacy is to say that you take, so there is this entropy, which is the, the, the total entropy of the map, but there are some pieces of, of the map which may have a smaller entropy. So, and then you collapse all the pieces that have smaller entropy, you, you collapse them to points, and that's again the same semi conjugacy to the piece right linear model. So here, that's more or less what we're going to do today, except that I'm not going to collapse a smaller entropy. I'm going to collapse only zero entropy. Okay? So let me say how, how we do this. And for that, I'll say what, what, you know, how I want to calculate entropy and all that. Okay? So we're just going to start, start with a quick recall of what, or what entropy is. We start with the metric space, say, okay, and a self map of the metric space. Let, 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 let's say a homeomorphism of the metric space. Okay? And then you're given a, a number, epsilon bigger than zero. And we say that two points are in epsilon separated. So this, this is a separation. This is your glasses. So your glasses are, are epsilon good. And you want to be able to spot these two points within n iterates, the map. So that means exactly this, that you know may, maybe the, the two points are very close to each other. But after we iterate them n, n times, they at some point between the zeroth iterate and the n minus first iterate, they become epsilon apart. And then you, and then you see them, aha, it's two points. Okay, and then you count them. So, okay, it's two points instead of just one. Right? 
So, uh, so that's what n epsilon separated sets are. And now you can do the following: to take, take any compact subset of your your metric space, all right, and then fill it with with n epsilon separated points. Okay, so you start putting points in your in your in your in your set, so that any pair of such points is n epsilon separated. Well, if you put too many points, then you, you can't do it because they start to have to be too close to each other. So I want to put the biggest number possible of points in there, every pair of which is n epsilon separated. Okay, so that's that's these, and, and then you count that number. Okay, so for each n, well, we fix epsilon. Epsilon is fixed, and for each, and then you fix n two, and then you fill up your your set K with n epsilon separated points. Okay. So that's and then, and then you count that number, the cardinality of a maximum n epsilon separated subset of k, okay? and then you're going to take some 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 limits, right? So you take n going to infinity, you take the limb soup. Well, so this number of such points typically grows exponentially. If it doesn't grow, then the entropy is zero anyway. But then you talk, take the logarithm of the of this of this number, divide by n, take the limb soup of that, and then you take the limit as epsilon goes to zero. And you see, I never said that K was an invariant set. It's just any set. And this is the entropy of F in K, right? So that's the entropy of F in K. And then you can define the entropy of, of, of F on your whole metric space to be the soup, the supremum over all compact subsets. And that's a way of defining entropy on, on non-compact spaces. Okay? This, is the Bowen, this is Bowen's definition of entropy. Topological entropy. Okay, now we can uh, talk about zero entropy equivalent. You declare two points to be zero entropy equivalent if you can join these two points by a continuum which has zero entropy. Let me say this again. So two, uh, two points X and Y are zero entropy equivalent. If there is a continuum C which contains both points and which carries zero entropy. But if this continuum should, but okay, so this continuum should get should carry zero entropy under F and F minus one. Okay, so, so if you can find such a continuum that contains both points and the continuum carries zero entropy for the future and the past, then you call these points zero entropy, right? And you say that the homeomorphism is tight if this condition of carrying zero, zero entropy on the, in the future and the past only holds for, for points. Okay, so any continuum which is not trivial, which has got more than a point, uh, uh, has positive entropy either in the future or the past, or both. Okay. So that's that's a tight homeomorphism. And here's a theorem that I proved with Miguel Paternoy a number of years ago. It says that it, it's it's a nice theorem in that it has not many hypotheses. It, it take a surface uh, diffeomorphism, uh, which is class C two. Then this zero entropy equivalence turns out to be a, a monotone upper semi continuity composition of the, 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 of the surface. Uh, and, and therefore, you can take the quotient because, I mean, this is clearly uh, F invariant. So you can take the quotient and then you take the quotient, and I'm calling the quotient phi x. And then x is not quite a surface, but it's almost a surface is what is called a generalized cactoid. And I'll, I'll show a picture in a second. And then you get the homeomorphism of the generalized cactoid, which has the same entropy as the, as the, as the original map. Okay? And the well, ball, okay, and, and then what? Well, then, then this homeomorphism in the, the quotient is tight. So the, the, the zero entropy, so you, you collapse these in zero entropy pieces. And then in the quotient, you get a map which has exactly the same entropy as above because all you've collapsed are zero entropy pieces. And, but, but also what, what happens is that in, in the, the quotient, nothing has zero entropy anymore except points. Is this so the concept is also from the paper or? Zero entropy equivalence. Yeah, yeah, yeah I had introduced this in a previous paper and then we proved this together yeah. later. Yeah, this, yeah. Uh, all right, so so here's what a, a generalized cactoid is. A generalized cactoid is a pinched surface. Okay? Well, it really it can be very, very pinched. For example, it can have some pieces which are graphed, or maybe you can pinch it in a cantor set with the points. But anyway, uh, so that's what a, a generalized cactoid is. And right, so 
That's that. And then wh why do I, I take C2? Well, I took C2 because secretly, you know, I said it was had a few hypotheses, but I have I had to use some heavy duty stuff here. And what I have to use uh, here is, is peasant theory. So I need C1 plus epsilon. Okay? So I need peasant theory. And right, and that the topological entropies above and below are the same follows from a theorem of Bowen that, that anyway, it's one of the many great theorems of Bowen's. Okay, so that's that's the result that, that you know, through Miguel. And all right, so that's, oh, okay, so let me show examples, okay? So here again is the horseshoe, but maybe I should have talked about this horseshoe, which is the usual way in which we, we see Ismail's horseshoe, and Ismail's horseshoe is like that. You take a square, you squeeze it, bend it, and put it back inside of the square. And, you know, and then, right, and then you cap off the square, the, the two ends, so that you, you, maybe you put an attractor inside of here, so that this semi, this half disk here maps strictly inside of itself with an attractor there. This half disk here maps inside of that and then gets attracted to the attractor. But then what we're really interested in is what happens within the square. And then we also put a repeller at, at infinity, infinity is through there. Anyway, so, um, so that's the, the usual horseshoe. And then you can make this map as differentiable as you want to see infinity different morphism. And in fact, I even showed uh, pictures of, of an map here for the A parameter large enough. That is a horseshoe, essentially this map here and it's super differentiable. In fact, it's a polynomial different morphism, et cetera. Okay, so that's the, the usual horseshoe. And here is a, a rendering. So this, this horseshoe has this attracting fixed point here, but it also has a fixed point inside of there, which you know Jackson Pollock, uh, you know, uh, made this picture of this unstable and stable manifolds of of this fixed point here, and the blue one is 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 the unstable manifold. The red one is the stable manifold. Of this fixed point at, at the bottom here. Okay. And uh, right, so the next, uh, right, so all right, here, so maybe I didn't show it last time around, but here, here's the, the Henon map. Okay. So this is a, a Henon, uh, th these are the stable and unstable manifolds of the, the Henon uh, map, like as I showed in Toby's. So this is a picture taken from Toby's program. And, and A here is large enough, and the fact that you know these guys cross. Is well, anyway, so it's a better rendering of, of this picture. Okay, so right, right. And now the intersections of the red and blue uh, are or countable, but anyway, if you take the closure, that is a cantor set. And that cantor set, if you restrict attention to that cantor set, uh, uh, the map, well, that's an invariant cantor set, and then the dynamics is conjugate to the full two-sided two-shift instead of the two-sided one-shift, which is not interesting, admittedly. Okay, so that's the horseshoe, and okay, so and this is, <clears throat> now these are the equivalence classes uh, of, uh, of the zero entropy equivalence relation for the, for the, for the horseshoe, okay? So, uh, so right, so here there's this big, you know, quadrilateral in the middle here, which in this nice flint uh, sort of rendering of the, of the picture is, is, is a square. And then there's, you know, there are other rectangles. So, so th these again are the stable and unstable manifolds, which I should have called it, I didn't, sorry. There's the, the red and the blue is the stable and unstable manifolds. And then you get all these, these pieces, which are sort of from the outside of the thing. And, and then you get all of these pieces, those, those bygone looking things. And then there's a piece all the way at infinity, which sort of includes you know, the point at infinity. So those are all zero entropy uh, 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 equivalence classes, but there are other types of equivalence class here, which are like you know, deep points in the Cantor set cross intervals in the middle there and there, and you know, lying fl flat here and there, et cetera. So well, that's what the zero entropy equivalence in the case of the horseshoe is. And uh, guess what? Right. So once you have such a, 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 a 
a, a, a decomposition, and you know, if you believe that, you know, maybe, or if you look at this decomposition in its own right and prove yourself that it's a monotone upper semi-continuous decomposition of the sphere, <clears throat> then you can use a theorem by R which says that the quotient of this of the sphere by this decomposition is again a two-sphere. And since there are no separating curve, then the quotient is an actual sphere, not some some wild tactoid, okay? Mm -hmm. So it's an actual two sphere. And then, you know, guess what the, the quotient, and this is all dynamically invariant, so what is the quotient map? So, and I didn't answer it in the slide. So the quotient is, oops, I didn't answer it anywhere, even in the next slide. <laughs> so the quotient map is exactly that tight horseshoe that I drew uh, in, the, in the previous talk and in the, in the previous half as well. So this thing that takes the square and squeezes by exactly a half, stretches it by exactly two, and puts it inside of itself by ripping, and then you glue that, glue that, and blah, blah, blah. And that's exactly the same thing that you obtain this here, okay? by a different method. OK, so right. So OK, so then, OK, so that's an example. But then what is what might be true in general? And here's a conjecture. Uh, which you, you can you can uh, be uh, more uh, adventurous and, and, and make broader you know, more difficult conjectures to prove. But here, here's one version of, that you can say. Like, so we're going back to the situation where we want to see whether uh, a three-dimensional homeomorph diffeomorphism, say, has a model in this class of measurable pseudomorphic of maps. So I'll define, so if F is a diffeomorphism and P uh, is some saddle periodic point, the saddle fixed point, uh, then the homoclinic class of P is the closure of the set of transverse homoclinic intersections of P. Okay? So you take P, it's a saddle, has a stable and unstable manifold. These stable and unstable manifolds may or may not intersect, and they may or may not intersect transversely. If they do, you take all such points, you take the closure of that, and that's the homoclinic class of P. Okay, so for example, in the horseshoe, that's that's what it is, right? So this is that, oops. So that's the fixed point here, and these are stable and unstable manifolds. You take the intersection, they are counting many such, but you take the closure, that's that Kenter set that we talked about. Okay, so take the homoclinic class of a point, and then let's assume, so here, here's a conjecture that I, 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 I asked Tanya uh, to, to look into. Uh, that if you start with this move, okay, so then you need you need conditions here, and maybe you need a condition to be able to use uh, Provisier, Sarig, uh, and Bouzy, or something, some, some. So, but but so suppose you have a smooth surface diffio, and assume say that you have a single homoclinic class, okay, then the zero entropy quotient should be an, a measurable measurable pseudonosic map. Uh, so if it, it has many homoclinic classes, which is the analog, the two-dimensional analog of, of being renormalizable in dimension one, then you have to think about it and maybe do something a little more zero delicate. The zero entropy quotient, this thing of... And dynamics is present. Dynamics? It's this portion. Is, do, do, do you collapse the zero entropy pieces and then, and then you remain with, you know, same, same everything else, right? But 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 not not right. So in in our theorem, we know that this quotient exists. It is well, supposedly smooth, and uh, that well, if it has a single homoclinic class, it has to, it should have added structure. The quotient should you know maybe be a transitive map, etc. And we know it's tight, right? But that's that's a, you know that's not we we need a lot more to call a map measurable pseudo nozzle. We really need the measure maximal entropy here to project to some measure, invariant measure down here. And this measure of maximum entropy really be the product of two measures along the stable and stable directions. There is a whole, you know, whole structure that has to be, be true. Okay. All right. So that's that's a, a conjecture. And right, another PhD student uh, who is finishing his thesis uh, has proved this statement. Uh, for uh, in fact, it's slightly stronger because he doesn't have to uh, uh, to assume a single homoclinic class. Uh, 
as proved this statement for male surface diffeomorphism. Male means the axiome with trunk trunk transversality. Okay, so if you have axiome an axiome uh, uh, surface diffeomorphism, and and you also assume strong transverse transversality, although I don't think that's very important. But in any case, if you have an axiome and you have oh right, uh, I should have said that. But there's an added hypothesis here that you may have different many pieces to your 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 non-wandering set, but they cannot be uh, related by this male order. Okay, so you can't have unstable manifolds of one basic piece intersecting stable manifolds of a different basic piece. So if they exist, you want the, the, them to be unconnected. But you know, if you assume that, then uh, uh, Jean Paulo has has proved this conjecture in that. Um, and okay, Ooh. okay, that's it. <laughs> I uh, yeah right. So that that ended what I wanted to to say. Uh, and uh, yeah, so thank you. Thank you, Andre. And then questions to comments from the audience. The last time you were talking about generalization variation of animations, we discussed the general probability. This these uh, fibers are just zero and what the no. No, no, there, there, there would be an unstable, the stable. I don't know if I understand what you asked, but no, here you have the the, partition. And no, 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 yeah, the, 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 the different partitions. The, the, yeah, there, they are meant to be the stable and unstable foliations, for example, yeah. or, 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 and here there are these gaps in, between the intersections. These are the gaps. Right. These are the gaps. Yeah. Yeah. That, 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 that's there's a dual discussion there. Yeah, Th those in fact are the foliation that remain after you collapse these gaps. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, so I'm, I guess, I, yeah, but anyway, I, I was once told that, you know, the audience is usually happy when you finish before uh, you should have. So I just finished before I should have. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right.